We're reading from Colossians 1, from verse 1, and it starts off with the heading greeting. It's Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father, thanksgiving and prayers. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins, the preeminence of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul's ministry to the church. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery of hidden ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this ministry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Well, Natasha, thank you very much. Uh, and before we look at this passage, this come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you once again that we can gather together as your people in your presence in this place. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that you would speak into the hearts and minds of each and every one of us here this morning. We ask, Father, that you would have mercy on us and that you would be drawing us closer to 
to yourself. We ask, Father, that you would be renewing our minds, that you would be transforming hearts. Especially, Father, if there's anyone here this morning who does not yet know your Son, Jesus, as their Lord and Saviour, would you have mercy on them? Would you be drawing them to yourself and would they put their faith in the risen Lord Jesus? He is the one we have come to proclaim. No one else. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, a recent survey of the general public by the Evangelical Alliance called the Talking Jesus Report. Well, it identified some interesting stats. Here's a snippet. Only 20% thought Jesus is God in human flesh. Only 27% thought that he was moral. Only 30% thought that Jesus was loving. Only 25% thought that he was peaceful. And only 16% believe in the resurrection. That means 84% of people will think that Jesus is dead. Well, these are concerning stats, but are they surprising in our culture today? And with such wide-ranging responses, well, we need to ask, who is the real, authentic Jesus? Well, we're going to turn to Scripture. We're going to turn to the book of Colossians. And this is a timeless message, speaking into many of the dilemmas and issues facing us today. Questions like, did the universe evolve or, or was it created? Did we come from monkeys? Should we do more multi-faith things for the sake of world cohesion, unity and togetherness to get closer to God? Uh, and what is truth? Uh, I have mine, and you have yours. Absolutes are denied. Uh, you can even be branded an intolerant bigot if you say that Jesus is the only means to salvation. And who is Jesus anyway? How can we really know who he is? Well, thankfully, the book of Colossians gives us Jesus' true identity. And it presents him as the answer to these issues. And over the next four sittings, I hope to cover the biggest, the big ideas contained in this book of Colossians before the end of the year. Well, what, what about the city? Well, Colossae is a city located in the Roman province of Asia, which is now part of modern day Turkey. It was once a great city, but in Roman times, it was small and it was in decline. It, it had been overshadowed by its more prosperous neighbours. Colossae was destroyed in the 12th century, but still today, we can still see some of the ruins. And I would encourage you to Google Colossae when you go home. It's absolutely fascinating what is still there today. Well, what about the church at Colossae? Well, it was founded by Epaphras. He was a native from Colossae, and in Ephesus, he became a Christian through Paul's ministry. He went home and he started a church. But despite his hard work, the Colossian church, well, it was under attack and it was in serious danger as heresy had arisen from the false teachers. Heresy, well, it's a bit like fake news today. And these false teachers, well, they loved to share fake news about the Lord Jesus. And this was threatening the very life and soul of the church. They attacked who Jesus really was, and they had denied what he had achieved for his people. And so this was serious, and Epaphras, well, he was so concerned, he made the 1,300-mile trip to Rome and to speak to Paul in prison. And, and Paul, and he said, Paul, I need your help. These lies and these false teachers, they're attacking the church. And so the church, well, it was under siege, and the ramparts well, they were up, but the enemy was advancing with their siege weapons of lies and heresy, which could lead to the death and destruction of this church. Well, what does Paul do in response? Well, he wrote a letter called Colossians, well, we call it Colossians, to warn against the dangers of believing 
and being taken captive by these heresies. And well, what, what, what were the weapons of the heresy? Well, Colossae was a mix of Jews and Gentiles, and so it was no surprise that the heresy threatening the church came from both sides. There was the real threat of the surrounding pagan culture. There was the real threat of Greek uh, philosophy, and then there was legalistic Judaism of impregnating this church. The, the Greeks, well, they loved knowledge. They prided themselves in their sophistication and their philosophical ideas. And they even dared question the humanity and divinity of Christ. Some said he was just another angel who they even worshipped. They believed that Jesus was not sufficient for salvation. And this gospel, well, it was just, it's just far too simplistic. We need maybe some of Jesus, but just some of this other stuff. But we need superior knowledge, allegedly gained through visions. And there were some who advocated the old Jewish ceremonialism, but it was still needed. Rigorous self-denial, harsh treatment of the body, keeping dietary laws and observing holy laws, holy days. And so Paul writes in response to counter these heresies. Well, what is the big theme? Of the letter? Well, chapter 3 tells us Christ is all and is in all. And so Colossians is a wonderful letter about the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I encourage you to read all four chapters? It will take you 20 minutes when you go home today or find another time. It is a glorious book about the Lord Jesus. So then let's ask who is the real Jesus? According to his word. Well, social media profile bios are short summaries of who a person is. Or if you go to the back sleeve of a book, the cover will tell you a little bit about the author. Well, I want us now to zoom into verses 15 and 20. And this is Jesus' bio. And here we're going to consider seven things that Paul reveals about Christ. Well, and firstly, in, chapter, in verses 15 and 19, we see that Jesus is fully God, and that he is fully man. In verse 15, Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of God. We are made in God's image. Jesus is the image of God. There's a big difference there. And as image bearers of Christ, of God, well, we possess intellect, emotion, and will and this enables us to think to feel and to choose but we are not the perfect image of God he is perfectly holy and we are sinful but we are not omniscient we are not omnipotent omnipotent we are not immutable we are not omnipresent but Jesus is and Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God you see, Jesus is divine and we are human. The word here for image means that Jesus is both the representation and the manifestation of God. That he is the full, final and complete revelation. Jesus really is God in human flesh. And if you want to get to know God better, get to know him through the being and external works of his incarnated son. The four Gospels have plenty to say about Christ. A favourite song for the kids at Sunday school back in Charlotte Chapel, and I would sing it if the kids were here, but they're not, so I'm not going to embarrass myself, is Fully God, Fully Man. If you're from the chapel, you'll probably know the song. You've probably heard the kids singing it. Fully God and Fully Man. And Paul confirms this in verse 19 where he says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. No other man can genuinely claim this. But one has recently, James from South Manchester. He believes he has absolute divinity. He believes he is deity. Well, I think James is a nutcase. I think he is a heretic. And he is a modern day false teacher. And I think he's delusional. Well, then moving on, secondly, Jesus is the firstborn. 
in verse 15. Jesus is identified as the firstborn. Well, from the Aryan heretics of the early church to Jehovah Witnesses of our day, who both deny Christ's deity, well, they have sought support from this passage. They argue that it speaks of Christ being a created being. Well, they completely miss the true meaning and context. Although it could mean created as firstborn chronologically, well, here it refer refers <coughs> primarily to position and rank. Uh, firstborn in both Greek and Hebrew culture it enjoyed authority and sovereignty. If we think back to the Old Testament, although Esau was the firstborn, Jacob, his younger brother, was in fact the firstborn who received the inheritance. Uh, King David in the Psalms is referred to as the firstborn. Well, he wasn't the first king, nor was he the eldest son, but, but he was identified as the firstborn to designate sovereignty and rule. And then in Psalm 89, God says his Messiah, he shall make him my firstborn. And so Jesus, as firstborn over all creation, well, he is sovereign. He has the highest authority and rule over everything. If Paul was arguing that Christ was created, was a created being, that he would be siding with the Colossi heretics who de denied his divinity and equality with God. But no, Paul is clear. Christ is fully God and the firstborn of all creation. And then thirdly, we see Jesus is created in verse 16. And here, well, Paul, he's refuting the Colossi false teachers who peddled the false philosophical idea of dualism. At its most basic understanding, they believe that God was good and that matter is evil. And so God couldn't possibly have created the universe. Well, dualism has existed in, in different forms and flavours in multiple historical sects and traditions of Christianity. But they are contrary to this truth of scripture. And Paul makes it abundantly clear that in verse 16, all things were created in him. Genesis 1 tells us, and God said. Well, we know from John 1 that that was Jesus speaking the word. The sun spoke and, and things came into being. Genesis also tells us that he spoke and created the heavens and the earth. He created living creatures and man in his image. Well, he spoke all these things into existence. Well, in 1977, Voyager 2, an interplanetary probe launched to observe record and send back information about the outer planetary system. Uh, by 1989, it reached Neptune, a staggering 2,700 million miles away. It then moved on, leaving our solar system. And space is so va vast that while even traveling at 90,000 miles per hour, it will not come to within one light year of any other star for 958,000 years. Space is so fast. In our galaxy alone, there's estimated to be around 100 billion stars, of which our sun is one. <coughs> our galaxy is just one of two trillion other galaxies out there. Space is so massive. It's so fast, it's, it's hard to get our minds around, isn't it? But listen to how the writer in Genesis 1, 16 sums this all up. He also made the stars. Kind of feels a bit of an understatement, doesn't it? Kind of like the guys that built the, the wall of China, we, we built the small fence. Just feels really understated. But such incredible power. Jesus spoke and these things came into being. Uh, folks, allow that to fill our minds with wonder. He also made the stars. But then what about our bodies? Well, take our brains and their staggering complexity and processing capacity. Uh, our brains have 100 billion neurons and several hundred trillion synaptic connections. 
that can process and exchange large amounts of information over a distributed network of brain tissue in a matter of milliseconds. And such massive parallel processing, processing capacity, well, that permits our brains to analyse complex images in one tenth of a second. And that allows us to enjoy God's rich creation. The storage capacity of the human brain, well, it's nearly infinite. During our lifetime, our brains can amass up to 10 to the power of 20. So that's a 10 with 20 zeros bits of information. Information is absolutely staggering. And we get impressed when our mobile phones go from 256 gigabytes to 512. But what about our bodies? What about our DNA? Well, scientists have studied the six feet of DNA tightly coiled inside every one of our bodies, one trillion, hundred trillion cells. And they have marveled at how it provides the genetic, genetic information necessary to create all the protein out of which our bodies are built. And from DNA's respiratory of digital code, it, it contains the instructions for each cell's machinery of how to assemble proteins in the form of a four character chemical digital code. But folks, this isn't a science lesson. I'm just <laughs> trying to make a point of how wonderful uh, our bodies are. And, and properly arranging these four chemical bases, well, it, that will instruct the cells to build different sequences in amino acids. And these are the building blocks of proteins needed for life. And each protein typically needs these four characters arranged in sequence of up to 2,000 characters. So there's 20 and a half thousand different types of proteins in our bodies. So DNA is like a library containing this genetic information. And science recognizes that information relies on intelligence. And so we must ask, where did this genetic information come from? Doesn't our DNA demand a designer? You see, each part of us is carefully, wonderfully designed, crafted, and spoken into existence by Jesus. <coughs> Folks, we did not evolve from slugs or monkeys. In fact, period. And then in the middle of verse 16, we read visible. <coughs> and that's all the stuff that we see. And invisible, that's the stuff that we can't see, like the laws of physics and the spiritual realm. Then verse 16 continues, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Well, this is referring to the different ranks of the angels. Uh, and far from being an angel, as the heretics taught, Christ is the one who created the angels. Well, perhaps angel worship is, is not a big an issue today as it was back then. But we need to remember that Christ is above the angels. He is the one at the right hand of God and the angels and all authorities and powers we are subjected to him. And then fourthly, Jesus is the sustainer. Well, Jesus not only created all things, but in verse 17 we are told that he holds all things together. Jesus is the sustainer. <coughs> Jesus is the one who maintains the delicate balance necessary for life's existence. He is not an absentee landlord. Isaiah chapter 40 tells us that the stars are still there because of God's power. Could you imagine some of the stars going missing? Well, which one has dis disappeared tonight, boys? Ah, oh, there goes another. But no. God's power is needed to keep every last one of the billions of stars shining. If he decided they all would vanish. His power is behind the consistency of the universe. If I make a sound, it stops when I stop speaking. My sound only exists as I allow it. My sound has no existence of its own. And this is the nature and the condition of the universe. 
if Christ stopped sustaining it, it would have no basis to continue being here. It would all end. The sun rose this morning because Christ allowed it to. The gravity that is holding us on our seats and on our feet, every, all the air in our lungs, every heartbeat, is all because he enables it. Christ is the sustainer of all things. And then we move on to Jesus is the head of the church. Verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. Uh, there are so many metaphors for the church in scripture. Uh, we read a church being a family, a kingdom, a, a vineyard, a flock, a building, and a bride. But in 1 Corinthians and Romans 12, the church is understood as a body. A body is one organism with many functions served by God's people, his hands, his feet, his ears and eyes, uh, to whom God has distributed many gifts and talents to use for his purposes and glory. But interestingly, in 1 Corinthians and Romans 8, we are not told who the head of the church is until now. You see, headship and authority the headship and authority of Christ, well, it was not an issue in Corinth or in Rome, but here in Colossae it was. And so Paul emphasises that Christ is the head. He's not like a CEO in the business world, but rather he is the one who <coughs> energises and lovingly controls and guides every part, giving direction to the diversity of spiritual gifts and ministries within his church. And then in the middle of verse 18, we read, he is the beginning of the church. In Ephesians 1, 4 tells us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose his people and it was his sacrificial death and, and resurrection that provided the new life to be part of his worldwide church. And then moving on. Next, in the second half of verse 18, we read that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Here's how the NIV puts it so that in everything he might have the supremacy. I love that. Christ is supreme. Well, we've already read that Christ. Is the firstborn over all creation. Now we read he is the firstborn from the dead. Well, this shows his supremacy, his rule, his authority will continue even when this world has ended. Christ has the highest rank and authority across all time. By his resurrection, he showed his authority over life and death. And he will never die again. Christ has led the foundation for that hope and assurance in which we have and we can rejoice knowing that one day, if in Christ, our broken, sick, diseased bodies will be gloriously resurrected in the new creation to come. That's why Jesus in John 14 could claim, because I live, you too will. Folks, it stands to reason that the one who is fully God and fully man, who is firstborn, the creator and sustainer of all things, him who is the beginning and the head of the church, he has the right to the title of being preeminent and having the supremacy. There is no one in comparison to the Lord Jesus. This supremacy, this, this fullness of God, which dwells in Christ, well, this has practical provisions for humanity. And Christ is a massive source of blessing. And we're going to consider this now in our final point in verse 20, as we read that Jesus is the great peacemaker. If you look down with me at verse 20, and through him to reconcile, let's make peace to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven 
making peace by the blood of his cross. Well, we, we read in verse 16 that all things were created by him. And now we read that all things will be reconciled to him. Well, firstly, some background from Romans 8 tells us that God's good creation has been marred by man's sin. It's been subjected to fut futility and groans and suffers like the pains of childbirth. And interestingly, scientific evidence actually indicates that this is true, that the universe is losing its usable energy. If it weren't for Christ's sustaining power, well, the universe would eventually suffer a heat death, becoming dark and cold. You see, we live in a cursed earth, in a cursed universe. However, in the restored creation to come, all things in heaven will be made new and set free from the bondage and sin of corruption. You see, God and his creation will be reconciled and the curse of Genesis 3 will, it will be removed. Creation will be restored to its proper relationship with its creator and all evil and its consequences well, will be defeated. But then secondly, with all, all things, is Paul teaching universalism, the belief that the ultimate salvation of everyone? Sometime ago, a minister told his audience, in the end, everyone is going to be saved. I have hope even for the devil. Well, we know that that's just not quite true. In fact, you couldn't get any further from the truth we know that scripture interprets scripture, which paints a very different picture, story of redemption. And look down to verse 20. Peace with God it is possible now on earth only through the shedding of Jesus' blood on death on the cross. And then in verse 13, we read, believers have been transferred from the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his son, and this transfer, well, it's described as a rescue. Believers have been rescued from the domain of darkness, which in verse 21 is described as a place of God's enemies, those who are alienated from him because of their evil deeds. Other places in scripture describe it as a place of spiritual oppression, as a place of disobedience to God as a place of slavery to sin is discontentment, a lack of eternal purpose where we stood condemned on a pathway to eternal death, separated from God for all eternity. This is devastating, absolutely devastating. But believers, Christians, those who have put their faith in Christ, those who have been rescued into the kingdom of his son in verse 22. Well, it describes it as a place as believers are presented holy in God's sight, blameless and above reproach. That is what it means to be reconciled to God, no longer his enemies. And verse 14, our sins are forgiven. And in verse 12, this is a kingdom where we will receive an inheritance, a guarantee of eternal life of Christ. And who paid for the rescue? What was the fee? Verse 19 and 22 tell us, well, it was Christ's blood shed for his cruel barbaric death. You see, Jesus paid the price with his own life. It was Christ's life, not ours. Isn't he so kind? Isn't he so full of grace and mercy to lay down his life as a ransom for many? If you're a believer this morning, please be assured that the transfer is complete. But what about those who are not yet believers? Well, they too will be reconciled to God through judgment. 
but in a sense of submission to final sentencing. Philippians 2 tells us, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then they will be sentenced to a lost eternity in hell. Separated from the presence of Christ and his blessing, unable to delight his good creation anymore. Well, can I ask you this morning, have you been rescued from the domain of darkness? If you have not yet been rescued from the domain of darkness, can I plead with you to put your faith in the risen Christ? He is the only one who can reconcile you to God. And this is a reconciliation that lasts on eternity. Well, it turns out that Jesus is a big deal. How foolish the false teachers at Colossae were to deny the real, authentic Jesus. And at Bones Baptist and other places, we need to guard ourselves against false teachers peddling a diminished view of Christ and how his salvation is obtained. To entertain a lesser view of Christ is to sign our death warrant as an effective church of Christ. To teach a false man-made gospel apart from Christ is to give people a false hope of salvation. Folks, we, we dare not budge from Scripture. We dare not budge from its clear teaching on the identity and the reconciliatory works of Christ. We need to stay strong in our <coughs> biblical convictions about whom Christ is and what he has achieved, despite the competing ideas, the beliefs and the philosophies that are out there, even in so-called churches today in Scotland. One such competing idea was preached from a mainline denomination pulpit in Edinburgh recently. I quote, this is what the minister said, I quote, Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? With grace I replied, no, 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 no. That's ghastly theology. You don't want to go there. An article written by Daniel Davis serving in Harrison in response to the heresy that led to the steady decline of another mainline denomination in Scotland asks, how did we come to this? How this church came to change Christ's teaching is the story of every fall in the heresy. It begins with a truth. Heresy then takes it. It expands its scope and meaning until other truths are abandoned and the church falls into error. This is how good, intelligent, thoughtful people are led astray. Don't we think this could never happen to us? Well, we need to stay strong and be bold in our biblical convictions about the real, authentic Christ. Well, let's close with the words of Pure in John Owen, words which are steeped in scriptural truth. John Owen. The revelation of Christ is the blessed gospel, is far more excellent, more glorious, and more filled with rays of divine wisdom and goodness than the whole creation and the just comprehension of it, if attainable, can contain or afford. This, therefore, deserves the severest of our thoughts, the best of our meditations, and our utmost diligence in them, the holding of Christ's glory. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus, that he can be known, that he has been revealed to us. Father, may we never shift from the clear biblical teachings of the personhood and works of Christ. Father, may your Son, the real, authentic Lord Jesus, be made famous in Bones. And Father, we ask because only you can do that. And Father, would you do that through us, your people? And so, Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>